Nose art is one of my favourite art forms. It's a fascinating look at the potential of art to not only individualise a plane, but also to provide psychological comfort. They are finite artworks, made a lot of the time by an unknown artist. Nose art is a decorative painting or design on the fuselage of an aircraft, usually on the front fuselage. For simplicity's sake, I am going to include any part of the plane, including the vertical stabilizer and wings. The earliest known example of nose art was a 1913 Italian flying boat with a large sea monster painted on. From there, the idea of nose art really started to take off. Most notably with Swedish aviation pioneer, the Flying Baron, Carl Sjöderström, who similarly applied a fish motif to his plane, calling it Flying Fish, or Flying Fish. During World War I, we saw a new era of aerial warfare being forged. Pilots saw themselves as sort of descendants of medieval knights, knights of the air, not part of the indiscriminate and anonymous mass killing on the ground, but fighting in individual combat, like knights who would paint their shields and even armour as a form of identification, World War I pilots also liked to individualise their planes. The most famous nose art, the Jaws, first appeared on German Roland C2s and SOP with dolphins. Though they were less menacing and more, well, shall we say, comical. Another well-known icon, the Cavallino Rapante, or the Prancing Horse, has its origins with the Italian ace Francisco Baracca. Nose art really exploded in Germany in World War I, most notably with the Jagdstaffel, or the Hunting Squadron, which was a squadron that did not do patrols, rather they were mobilised in response to sightings of enemy fighters. Their mission was essentially aggressive aerial warfare, New German aircraft left the factory with the standard finish, with slight variation from one manufacturer to another. However, some pilots took to repainting their machines to their own personal preferences. Most notably Manfred von Richthofen, or the Red Baron, who was also part of the Jagdstaffel squadron, who famously painted his Fokker triplane all red. This was to act as not only a way to instill fear into his enemies, but to also act as a rally point for his men to order behind. Pilots of his squadron followed suit, all painting at least some part of their machine red, while reserving the all red machine for the Commander Richthofen. During combat, many pilots on both sides noted that the resulting contrast of bright, colourful German planes and plain khaki allied planes was helpful in distinguishing between friend or foe. As British and French pilots began to paint their planes, it was much more subtle, normally only a name or personal insignia. In 1918, the Americans entered the war and without official authorization, created their own insignias for their squadrons. Some notable examples are kicking the mule and hat in the ring. This was followed by official policy, established by the American Expeditionary Forces Chief of Air Service, Brigadier General Benjamin Folius on 6th of May 1918, requiring the creation of distinct, readily identifiable squadron insignia. While the practice was originally for practical purposes, it quickly evolved into a way for pilots to express their individuality, often constrained by the uniformity of the military. The art would often evoke memories of home and peacetime life. The art was also a kind of psychological protection against the stresses of war and probability of death. They were not encouraged by the military, but were tolerated as a way to help maintain morale. I think my favourite was a collection of Newport single-seaters called The Flying Fish. I believe this one is called Jazzbo, but historical data is sketchy to say the least. But I love this plane. The beautiful wings, the gorgeous tailplane, the incredible engine cowling. It's truly a work of art. I think my favourite part is the front cowl mouth. It's got a slight smile that gently approaches the cowl, then suddenly gets larger to encompass the whole cowl opening. 
On any other plane, that style of jaws would look strange and out of place, but it is very in keeping with the rest of the style of the plane. I think the fact that these pictures are in black and white only adds to its brilliance. It's up to our imagination as to what the colours were. And to think about how long it must have taken to create this, possibly days, and we may never know the artist's name. I think this picture of the plane is my favourite. It's a beautiful image. It's in focus with great exposure. The sun low in the sky, maybe early morning. We see reflections on the fuselage and wing. We see a man standing at the front of the plane, possibly about to start it, and a pilot in the cockpit about to go into battle. The plane sits still, waiting to be started, waiting to be awakened. The eye of the plane seems to look back at the camera. Knowing what's to come, it gives the camera a smile. That's why I love nose art. It makes the plane come alive. The plane becomes an animal. It transcends being a machine and becomes something more. I was saddened when I couldn't find the identity of the pilot, or what happened to the plane. It was probably lost in an accident, lost in combat, or dismantled after the war. The only remaining history of the beautiful nose art is a handful of pictures. Even the most famous World War I plane, the Red Fokker triplane the Red Baron flew, only remains in images and pieces after it was shot down. Nose art is finite. It exists for a very brief amount of time, then it just disappears. Either painted over or the aircraft itself is destroyed, and we have only pictures left. Jim Muk for the History Channel writes, From the end of the Great War to the beginning of World War II, such personal markings in the US Army Air Corps all but disappeared. Restrictions imposed by peacetime regulations and the ideals of a spit and polish military did not allow for such frivolity. The squadron insignia remained, but it wouldn't be until the outbreak of World War II that personal designs would reappear. And when they did reappear, they did so with a bang.